Countering Terrorism Fighters Legislation Bill, second reading. Order, order, honour, uh, order. Such rudeness. Honourable oh. Chris Finlayson. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I move that the Countering Terrorist Fighters Legislation Bill be now read a second time. This is an omnibus bill which responds to the rapid evolution of the threat posed by those who want to commit terrorist acts both overseas and in New Zealand. And I want immediately to thank the Foreign Affairs and Trade Select Committee and the officials for the very good job they have done. And I particularly acknowledge the work of the Chair, Mr Mitchell, and the extremely helpful contributions of Messrs Shearer and Goff. Mr Speaker, members of the committee who speak this afternoon... Order. This is a serious debate and I want the level of... In order! I don't expect a uh, an opposition whip to interrupt when I'm on my feet. Honourable Chris Finlayson. Mr Speaker, members of the committee who speak this afternoon will address the individual changes the committee have recommended be made to the legislation. I think these changes greatly improve the bill. It was always intended to contain a targeted set of measures, and I believe those measures are even more targeted now than before the committee considered them. What I want to do is use the second reading speech to address a couple of issues which still appear to concern some people. First, the question has been raised about whether the term foreign fighter requires a definition. The government's view is that the term does not need specific definition in the bill. The bill does not create a standalone piece of legislation and the definition of terrorist act in section 5 of the Terrorism Suppression Act already provides the definition required. That definition is the core concept on which this legislation relies. Adding a definition of foreign fighter would be superfluous. We're targeting people by behaviour or intended behaviour, not by a label. The bill targets people who want to carry out a terrorist act either here in New Zealand, whether one calls them foreign terrorist fighters, as the UN did, or other violent extremists or something else. The actions of the people popularly referred to as foreign terrorist fighters, i.e. people who want to go and fight for ISIL, are just the latest manifestation of the terrorist acts already envisaged by and defined in the Terrorism Suppression Act. The second question which has arisen, sir, uh, and I think the Greens and others have asked it, is whether environmental activists could be caught by this legislation. The answer to that is no. Once again, I refer to the definition of a terrorist act in Section 5 of the Terrorism Suppression Act. Not only would an action by an activist have to fall within the definition of one of the specified terrorist acts, but I particularly refer members to section 5.5 5, uh, of that legislation, which is an av avoid doubt clause, and it states the fact, quote, a person engages in any protest, advocacy or dissent is not by itself a sufficient basis for inferring that the person's behaviour falls under the act. On top of that, the layers of oversight we now have, and not least the significant powers, the greatly strengthened powers of the Inspector General, ensure this could not be the case. The third issue, and I think this is Mr Shearer's, is whether the changes proposed in the bill still allow a person uh, uh, from going home to Kurdistan, for example, to defend his or her home. The first point I'd make is that this legislation does not change the existing legal situation of a person in that position. Section 8A of the Passports Act 1992, which was inserted into the Act in 2005 by the previous Labour government, already allows the cancellation of a passport on the grounds a person is a danger to the security of New Zealand because he or she intends to engage in or facilitate a terrorist act within the meaning of Section 5 of the Terrorism Suppression Act. That section defines a terrorist act as an act that occurs in any one or more countries, and I emphasise that phrase. 
So this bill really is a clarification of the existing situation. In fact, the only new procedure introduced by this bill is the ability to suspend New Zealand travel documents temporarily for up to 10 working days. The second point is that any person whose passport was to be cancelled would need to be intending to carry out or assist in one of the terrorist acts specified in Section 5 and in line with the purposes outlined in that section. As I said in the weekend, the same principle applies to anyone who's planning to go overseas to engage in or facilitate a terrorist act as defined by Section 5. The third point, sir, is that this bill does not go anywhere near as far as uh, the Australian legislation, which seeks to ban Australian citizens from even in, in travelling to certain areas unless they have lawful excuse. This legislation does not prevent New Zealanders from travelling to these areas, although obviously we'd strongly advise against it. As I said, in order to have a passport cancellation occur, the Minister must be satisfied the person intends to engage in or facilitate a terrorist act. That is the core concept uh, on which all these provisions apply. There are a number of difficulties posed by any suggestion we amend the definition of terrorist act to exempt, for example, a person returning to Kurdistan to fight ISIL. Uh, first, as I've said, the bill targets terrorist acts. We don't want to equivocate on that matter. We don't want New Zealanders getting caught up in this conflict in general, and we would not want any New Zealander committing any terrorist act on any side. Secondly, the passport cancellation system is a system under ministerial control. It requires ministerial discretion. The minister will have to take a number of factors into account when making a decision. Uh, thirdly, Amending the definition of terrorist act in the way proposed could put the minister making a decision regarding a passport cancellation in the difficult position of having to assess who is fighting for whom. Uh, that may be a more straightforward task when one considers ISIL and the Kurds, but this is a chaotic and fast developing situation. The distinction may not be so clear when considering individual areas of Syria. Mr Speaker, I don't think we want a minister having to decide whether an intended terrorist act may be excusable in the circumstances or not making specific legislative carve-outs in the Terrorism Suppression Act. I think that would undermine the purpose of the legislation, but it could also create a dangerous precedent. The main point is we do not want New Zealanders getting involved. So they were the three issues that I wanted to address, and as I said, I'm sure members of the committee speaking this afternoon uh, will address particular matters that arose in the course of the hearings. Uh, Mr Speaker, the final point I want to emphasise uh, is that this is temporary legislation. Uh, there is a sunset clause. We have a comprehensive review of all security legislation coming up, and this must begin no later than June 2015. Any changes recommended in that review and passed into law will supersede what we're debating today. If new legislation is not in force uh, by the time the sunset clause comes into operation, the provisions we're debating are going to lapse. The legislative product of that review will have a full select committee hearing, and I'm sure that some of the issues we've debated over the past few weeks will get another airing then. Once again, Mr Speaker, I thank the committee for its excellent work, and I commend the bill to the House.